Hello everybody and welcome to our second video on projections and datums. Recall in the first video we discussed uh, latitude-longitude systems. We discussed the fact that all spatial data have some coordinate system attached to them. Latitude-longitude works well for putting your position on the surface of a sphere or ellipsoid, but it makes it difficult to do a lot of common functions like distances and areas. And therefore we want to project data, and that means to take it from the curved surface and make it flat. Then there's three common projection surfaces we consider. There's the plane, the cone, and the cylinder. And they all have different qualities that make them attractive for different purposes. We can adjust each projection by setting where this projection surface touches the planet. We have secant and tangent versions where the projection surface either just touches the surface or intersects the planet. Shortly we're going to discuss why you would choose one projection over another and show a few projections that you're probably going to use a lot in your career. But before we get into that, I just wanted to show you a few projections that I really like. They're kind of fun. This one here is called the Bond Projection, and there's nothing particularly special about it by itself, but I remember this idea of changing each projection by adjusting where the surface touches the planet. If we adjust one of the parameters of the Bond projection, uh, specifically if we set the standard parallel to be at the North Pole, it becomes a special case called the Werner projection. This one is just graphically fun. I don't know if anybody uses it analytically, but it does make a fun shape. Okay, let's look at a few other interesting projections. They don't really fall into a single class like planar or conic or anything. Um, this good Hamala sign is actually formed by seven separate projections merged together. We refer to these multi-part projections as interrupted or discontinuous projections. This one is designed to show the shape of the land masses of the Earth with relatively little distortion. So the, the Earth is, is broken along the oceans. There's actually a version of the good Hamala sign designed to show the shapes of the oceans correctly with as little distortion as possible. This cube projection is just fun. It's not really useful for any kind of analysis, but you can print it up, you can cut it out and fold it, in, fold it into a cube. It's kind of fun. This is called a polyhedral projection. It means you take the same shape and form it into over, over the surface of a sphere. In this case, we're taking squares and forming it. Here we have another polyhedral projection called the Fuller projection, sometimes known as the Dimaxian projection. This one is composed of triangles that you can cut out and fold into a 20-sided object. If any of you ever played Dungeons and Dragons with those 20-sided dice, well, this is what you get. The Pierce Quincuncial is a neat one. It, it, it looks interesting all by itself, but it has this really interesting property in that it can be tiled. So you can just make a whole bunch of them, stitch them all together, and come up with this larger overall image. This one kind of reminds me of that movie Inception. The Waterman Butterfly, also called the Cahill Keys. It's a famous projection just because it is so aesthetically interesting. It is a pretty coordinate system. Uh, unfortunately, ArcMap doesn't have this as an option. The Gall Peters is really an interesting one historically. The idea was that people were upset by the fact that so many maps tended to overemphasize uh, Western European countries. The, they tended to be a lot larger on the planet than, than uh, less developed countries. And people felt this was some sort of cultural or cartographic imperialism or something. And so there arose a movement to try and get away from this, to try and represent all countries equally. So the size of the country would be fairly and equally represented by its size on the map. Now, of course, this is the exact definition of an equal area projection, but there's a ton of those that are already available. Uh, that didn't seem to People didn't seem to be aware of that at the time, I guess. So they came up with this Gall Peters projection. It it it's a it, it's actually an adaptation of a much older projection. But this thing just really became popular in the 70s and 80s. It it was advertised as a fair map projection, and so people started taking it up and having a a, a very strong dedication and devotion to it because of its its fairness. Colleges around the country began tearing down their old maps and replacing them with this thing. Now, of course, it is truly an ugly map. It really 
<laughs> and this this is one of the uglier projections that I know of. So it's kind of a kind of, so it's kind of funny that this particular one became so famous and popular. There's plenty of equal area maps that look much better than this. And then it got even worse because the person who was promoting this the most actually licensed it, so you couldn't use it without paying him a fee. You actually can't use this projection in ArcMap. It's not available, and it's probably because of that fee. A strange situation, a map projection that became part of a social movement. It was a bad map projection. All right, so why are you going to choose one projection over another? So remember that all projections distort. You can't take the curved surface of the planet and make it flat without distorting it. However, you can usually preserve some characteristic of the landscape that you care about. So projections are typically designed to maximize accuracy in one of four areas. They can maintain the shape correctly so it looks right. These things are called conformal projections. They can preserve the area of polygons. These are called equal area projections. The polygons themselves may be twisted and warped all out of recognition, but the area inside them is correct. Equidistant projections show accurate distances from particular points or along particular lines. Then there's azimuthal projections, which show the correct direction from particular points or along particular lines. Now, when you maximize accuracy in one of these, you usually lose accuracy in the other three, so you have to pick the projection that maximizes the property you care about. For mapping, you usually want a conformal projection, where for analysis, you typically want equal area, equidistant, or azimuthal projections. So let's look at some examples. Conformal projections make the landscape look correct. So take Greenland as an example. Greenland is famous for being way oversized in this geographic coordinate system. But if we use a conformal projection, then the shape of Greenland looks correct. It makes a much more aesthetically interesting and defensible map, I'd say. Equal area maps, on the other hand, the shape can be way twisted and warped, but the area within each polygon is correct. This particular example is called the sinusoidal projection, which is one of the more famous equal area projections. Sinusoidal is called a pseudo-cylindrical projection, meaning that it's a mathematical construction that's similar to a cylindrical projection. Here's an example of an equidistant projection. This projection shows the accurate distances to areas around Flagstaff. So I could put a ruler on this map, and as long as one end is hooked on Flagstaff, I could aim it anywhere on the landscape, and I could calculate the correct distance to that point. Equidistant coordinate systems are accurate from a point to other points or along a particular line. There aren't any projections where you can just take any point on the map and measure the distance to any other point and have it be accurate. Azimuthal maps are the same way. Um, they're accurate from a point to any other point or along a particular line. Uh, but this azimuthal example shows uh, if, if I put a ruler from Flagstaff to any other point, it will the line along that ruler will be the shortest path. It'll be the great circle path to that point. We discussed earlier planar projections. You could have the gnomonic, the stereographic, or the orthographic. And they all had that interesting property that if you went from the point of tangencies to any other point on the globe, then the line connecting those would be the great circle path. Those planar projections are all azimuthal maps. So, which projection do you use when you're starting your analysis? It all depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're making a pretty map, conformal projections are usually what you go with. Now you can set the map display to any coordinate system and therefore you can analyze data in one projection and you can display it in another. So you can always, you always have that flexibility. Now for analytical purposes, you want to calculate the size of a stand or the distance of a road. You'll probably want equal area, equidistant, or azimuthal projections. And as I said earlier, you can do your analysis in one coordinate system and then you can make the maps for your reports in another. There's this poster that's in your data folder, in the data slash documents folder. It kind of gives you some general guidelines about how you can choose a projection for the purpose you want. 
And there's also Snyder's album of map projections, which good, gives a lot of good info. John Snyder was a big name in map projections. He worked at the USGS for many, many years, and he invented a couple projections, including one that allowed him to map uh, Landsat imagery. He's even written a couple of popular books about projections and datums, which you don't hear of that often. So he wrote this album of map projections. It's one of many, many things he's written, and so I've added this into your data folder. Uh, it's a pretty interesting publication. It not only describes several map coordinate systems, like you see here, you can see them broken up into the cylindrical, the conic, the azimuthal. And in this case, those azimuthal ones are the planar coordinate systems. Note also there's some pseudo-cylindrical. These are similar conceptually to the cylindrical, but mathematically a little different. Well, he describes all of these, gives you good information about them, but even better, he shows you how they look on the landscape. So for example, this Mercator projection, this is how the Mercator looks when you map the globe with it. But even better, it gives you a page full of information describing it. Note that Mercator is a cylindrical and a conformal coordinate system. But look at this little thing up in the upright corner. This is a pretty neat way to illustrate distortion. So what we're seeing here is each circle represents the same area on the ground. And so you see that these circles get bigger as you get away from the equator. That means that the whole landscape is getting stretched both horizontally and vertically. Now take another coordinate system, the Lambert cylindrical equal area, for example. This is how it looks when you map the globe. Look at this interesting distortion pattern. You see here that the circles only get stretched horizontally as you get away from the equator. So there's no stretching vertically, but a lot of stretching horizontally. And he describes all of these coordinate systems this way. Really interesting way to get a sense of the projection distortion you'll encounter if you use that coordinate system. Now, just in case any of you are interested in the math behind projections and projection transformations, I've also put uh, Snyder's map projections used by the U.S. Geologic Survey in the BB Learn folder. Now, we're not going to go into any anything nearly with the depth that uh, Snyder does in this book. This is really in case you are interested, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be. Uh, it, it's it's just a really interesting and and complex topic and he is a master of it. He really gets down into the details and how to do these transformations and how to make a projection. This is one of the classic references for geodesists and it might be nice to have in your library. Now moving on, what projections are you actually likely to use in your career? So, so far we've discussed a lot of types of projections without really mentioning any specific ones except for those ones I just think are cool. Now, fortunately, most work we do is over a relatively small area, so we don't have to worry too much about distortion that's caused by the curve of the planet. So we just need to choose a projection that has lines of tangency or secancy that are near us. And as long as we stick to small areas, such as a national forest or a region of a state, then two really good choices are the UTM system and the state plane system. UTM and most state plane systems are transverse cylindrical projections designed mainly as conformal projections. But since we usually are looking at a fairly small area and because these projections tend to be close to a line of tangency or secancy, they really don't lose much accuracy in the way of size, distance, or direction. Not all states have a state plane system recorded, but for many of them they actually have several. In fact, Arizona has three. Now, between UTM and state plane, and in ecological applications, I personally see UTM used most often. You'll probably use UTM at some point, so you really should be aware of it and understand it. It works well for research or management projects that are less than a few hundred miles across, and, but it wouldn't work as well with really large phenomena like climate systems, ocean currents, or really long migration routes. Works great for really small projects like timberland sales or wildland fires or wildlife habitat studies. Now, UTM has a long history in ecological management and research. The USGS quads, those old 1 to 24,000 topo maps, they often had the UTM lines printed right on them for easy reference. We used to carry UTM grids with us in the field when we do our field work. Many forestry tools are designed to work directly with UTM coordinates. So what is it? It's a transverse cylindrical projection. It's a secant projection, which means it intersects the Earth along two lines of longitude. 
Now there are 60 different versions of the UTM projection. They're all called UTM zones, each of which is designed for a six degree longitudinal band. So your analysis area does not have to lie entirely within the zone, but don't go outside it too much. And if your analysis area is very large, you should use a different projection. Now Flagstaff is in UTM zone 12. Within the UTM zone, the projection distortion is minimized along these lines of intersection. This means that they are minimized at the edges of the zone. And just a reminder, when I say lines of intersection, I mean the intersection of that cylindrical projection surface with the surface of the planet. Now you can map outside of the zone boundaries. In fact, you can go up to plus or minus 45 degrees from the central meridian of the zone but accuracy does degrade the farther you get away from those lines of intersection. Now here's an example. Within, if we map the world in UTM zone coordinates, we can actually map this much of the world. We get all of North America, half of South America, but you can easily see the projection distortion once you get farther and farther away from the zone. It's really no problem to use a zone for data that are just outside the zone but you really don't want to get more than six degrees or so away from the zone. Now one important conclusion to draw from this slide is that if your analysis area does lie on the boundary between UTM zones, then you can use either UTM zone projection equally well and work, and both will work just fine for you. In fact, any data that is right on the boundary is actually going to be experiencing less distortion than data that's right in the center of the zone. Now this is an important point, so remember what I'm saying here. If the thing that you're studying crosses the boundary of the UTM zone, you are perfectly fine. This is the best of all possible worlds. Now, a lot of times people look at this and they get confused and they think that somehow they have to split their data into two different data sets, maybe cut it on the zone boundary. So you project half of it into say UTM zone 13 and the other half into UTM zone 12. But no, this is not necessary and really there's no point to it you can cross a zone boundary and be just fine. You can be sitting right there in the region defined by UTM zone 13, and you can project your data into the UTM zone 12 coordinate system. Everything is just fine. Many people, including myself, have made this mistake in the past and put ourselves through a lot of unnecessary pain trying to reproject half our data set into different coordinate systems. Okay, and that's what I have to say about projections. So let's just review what we've gone over so far. First off, all spatial data sets have a coordinate system. These coordinate systems can be either geographic, meaning that they're in lat-long coordinates and therefore are measured in degrees, or they can be projected, meaning that they are linear units and are usually in either meters or feet, but they could be in any linear system. There are three broad categories of projection surface, and that is planes, cones, and cylinders. There are four general things that we worry about when we choose a projection. We're trying to maintain one thing at the expense of the other three. Those four are conformal projections, meaning they maintain the shape, equal area projections, equidistant projections, and azimuthal projections. Then we looked at some coordinate systems that you'll probably use in your career, specifically UTM and, to a lesser degree, state plane. All right, so the next talk we'll go into datums. So as a heads up, when we talk about projecting, we're talking about projecting from the curved surface of a planet to a flat surface, right? But this all assumes that we know what that curved surface is, and it turns out there's more than one curved surface to choose from. So we'll get into that in the next lecture. See you soon. Thank you.